Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my channel. I am Dr. Rena Chavla and uh, today we will be discussing the NEAT PG OBS and Gynae recall questions, uh, uh, which was held on 11 September. The, uh, we will briefly discuss the answers and a bit about the solutions. Um, I hope all of you did well, the, well in the exam. It was a relatively easy paper, uh, especially the OBS and Gynae was more or less straightforward. But let's discuss and see how um, we've all performed. Okay, so um, just a second, yeah. So if you do like my channel, please subscribe and you'll get access to more videos, uh, which I post regularly. So just a brief analysis before we start, a brief analysis of the paper. Uh, there were lots of OBG questions, 26 to 28 questions, some integrated questions also. So around 26 questions were there in the paper from obstetrics and gynecology, similar to the INICT where we had 29 questions. So do expect a lot of questions from OBG. It's an easy scoring subject. It's a high yield subject and you shouldn't go wrong. And at least 90% of the questions were pretty straightforward. 75%, I would say, was, were easy questions. The rest were moderate. There was no difficult uh, question as such. And many topics uh, that were covered were expected topics. There were high yield topics, for example, malarian anomalies. There were four or five questions from that itself, on oral contraceptive pills. Then there were questions from medical complications in obstetrics. A lot of expected high yield um, areas were covered. Uh, clinical scenarios were a lot, especially the entire paper, in fact, other subjects also, also in OBS and gynae. And if you get the clinching uh, word or the clinching sentence, most of you was, uh, uh, would have answered correctly those scenarios. Uh, images were very less from OBG, surprisingly, only one image was there from OBG as against the INICT paper. They were also no match the following or multiple answer sorts, so most of it was pretty straightforward, uh, which is actually surprising because images uh, were expected to be more, but only one image and that were very easy image. So let's start with the discussion. Um, uh, the first question, a 25 year old primary gravida uh, on endomethacin, 25 milligram TDS for polyhydramnia still 35 weeks. What abnormality can the fetus um, develop if she goes into labor now? Would it be flap closure of the foramen of will? Would it be a patent ductus arteriosus? Would it be premature closure of the ductus arteriosus or premature closure of the ductus venosus? So the answer here is premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. So it is known that, um, one second. So it is known that uh, endomethacin is used for basically two purposes in obstetrics. Quickly, we will discuss this as a tocolytic and also as polyhydramnus. But what is important to remember is we should not use uh, endomethacin after 32 weeks. Why? Because after 32 weeks, it is known to cause premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. This is an important complication. When does the uh, uh, ductus arteriosus usually close? It is usually functionally closes soon after birth. And if it closes prematurely in utero, it can lead to pulmonary hypertension in the fetus and fetal death. Hence, it is contraindicated after 32 weeks of pregnancy if we are giving it for either purpose. Okay, so just a bit about uh, the fetal circulation. What is the ductus arteriosus? What is the ductus venosus? So, because there's another question also on fetal circulation. So, we'll quickly discuss this. So, blood enters from the placenta to the fetus via the umbilical vein. So, from the placenta oxygenated blood traverses from the placenta to the fetus via the umbilical vein. Here, the umbilical vein divides into the ductus venosus and the portal sinus. And the ductus venosus basically joins the inferior vena cava. So oxygenated blood reaches the heart, the right atrium, through the inferior vena cava. And uh, uh, from there, it goes into the right ventricle, the left side of the heart, and then it goes into the pulmonary artery where most of it is shunted by the ductus arteriosus into the iota okay and very few only eight percent of blood actually reaches the lungs okay so the ductus arteriosus basically is uh, uh, shunts blood from the pulmonary artery to the iota and then that blood goes to the rest of the body and the deoxygenated blood returns via the hypogastric arteries to hypogastric arteries which form the umbilical artery and that leads to that, that uh, returns deoxygenated blood back to the placenta. So oxygenated blood arrives from the placenta to the 
fetus via the umbilical vein and returns to the placenta. Deox blood returns to placenta via the umbilical artery. And that is the next question. So deox blood is returned from the placenta to the fetus through the, and the answer is the umbilical artery. All right, remember this artery carries blood from the fetus to the placenta. So it's basically opposite. And vein carries oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. Ductus arteriosus, I have told you, shunts blood from the pulmonary artery to the um, uh, iota and ductus venosus basically takes blood from the oxygenated blood from the uh, from the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. So the answer here is the umbilical artery. Most of you would have got this right, I'm sure. So it's simple, straightforward question. The third question, a married woman gives birth to twins. The husband doubts the paternity and gets a paternal, paternity test done. The test shows that he is the father of one infant, but not the other. So what is this? This is, is this superfetation is a superfecundation. One infant is atavistic or is one infant suppositorious? This also is a pretty straightforward question. Most of you get confused between superfecundation and superfetation. The answer here is superfecundation. Please remember superfecundation is when two over uh, are formed in this, are fertilized in the same menstrual cycle. Okay, the same menstrual cycle. And this, although very, very rare, it can happen in humans. Okay. And superfetation is when it happens in a different menstrual cycle. And this has never been documented in humans. It is documented in animals. So just to briefly explain to you. So fertilization of two ova in the same menstrual cycle. Okay. This is called a superfecundation. If you read Williams, this picture is from there. This is a classical case of um, uh, where two different men uh, uh, fertilize, so two different sperm um, fertilize two ova in the same men. There are two episodes of sexual intercourse in the same cycle. And from two different men, there were two embryos formed in the same cycle. It was a case of twin pregnancy. And when the babies were born, one was, um, uh, you can see the, uh, the, the racial difference. So this is a classical example of super fecundation. And this is the same scenario given in the similar scenario given in the question. Okay, super fetation, please remember, occurs in animals, especially horses. It is not seen and it has not been documented ever to happen in human beings because the endometrium will fuse. So two separate menstrual cycles, two over release from two different menstrual cycles, not proven in humans. So super fecundation is what is actually the answer. The other two options, atavistic, atavistic basically means vestigial and uh, uh, the other option basically means um, uh, 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 it is uh, basically fraudulent. So that, obviously that is not the answer. The answer is super fecundation. Okay, next question. A 28 year primary gravita who is a known case of mitral valve replacement presents at 36 weeks to the antenatal OPD. She's on warfarin 4 milligram. Which, which is correct regarding the anticoagulant therapy. Will you discontinue warfarin and start heparin? Will you discontinue warfarin and start heparin and aspirin? Will you discontinue warfarin and start aspirin? Or will you continue warfarin and start heparin? So the answer, the correct answer is discontinue warfarin and start heparin. So let's discuss a bit more about this. So basically a woman who has a history of valve replacement, in this case, mitral valve replacement, she will be obviously put on anticoagulants. So the uh, anticoagulant of choice is warfarin. But when a woman becomes pregnant, especially if she's on a high dose warfarin, that is five milligram or more in the first trimester itself, she should be switched over to heparin, either low molecular weight or unfractionated. That is because of the risk of warfarin embryopathy in the fetus. And this is seen after uh, in the first trimester and at a high dose of warfarin 5 milligram. That is why probably in this case, she was not side on warfarin in the first trimester. She has come in the third trimester and now we have to change. So now we will change it to heparin. Okay, so if a planned delivery is happening, shift to heparin at 34 to 36 weeks. Okay, the confusion could be why not aspirin also. So aspirin is also recommended by the American Heart Association, but only in women who are at, at a very high risk of developing coagulation so coagulopathy so uh, 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 there was nothing else mentioned in this question in this question straightforwardly the answer would be shift from warfarin to heparin at 36 weeks of gestation all right 
Now, next question was again very, very straightforward. A 25 year old woman presents to an antenatal OPD. This is her second pregnancy. So, and her first pregnancy was four years earlier, where she developed, developed, developed twins at term. So, this is a commonly asked question. They'll give a scenario of twins and then ask her parity index. So, please remember you should know what gravida is and you should know what para is. What is gravida? Gravida is the total number of pregnancies, including the present pregnancy. So, she's had one pregnancy earlier. And this is her second pregnancy, so she's gravida too. Okay, and what is parity? Parity is the number of pregnancies that have crossed the period of viability, excluding the present pregnancy. So it's not the number of fetuses, it's the number of pregnancies that have crossed the period of viability. So she developed a liver term. She's had one pregnancy which has crossed the period of viability, not two, one pregnancy. Twins means two fetuses, but the pregnancy is one. So she is G2. P1. Okay, she's G2P1. This is the correct answer. She's not G2P2. That doesn't even make sense. Okay, she can't be P2 because we are considering pregnancy. Number of pregnancies, not number of fetus. She would actually be G2P1 and L2. L2, L, L is the living issues, living children. That, if both are alive, will be living too. So G2P1, L2 is the complete parity index, but definitely not G3 and definitely not P2. Okay, so this is very straightforward and I'm guessing all of you should have got this correct. Okay, next question. A 28-year-old primary gravida is in labor. She has a repeated urge to pass urine and has premature bearing down. On examination, there is infra-umbilical flattening and the fetal heart is heard on the lateral side. What is the most likely presentation or position? Is it knee? Is it occipital posterior? Is it bro? Or is it a right dorsal anterior? And this also was pretty straightforward. The answer is occipital posterior. Why? Let us see. On history, when a patient has occipital posterior, you can see in this uh, diagram, the occiput is posterior as against an occipital anterior. So occipital anterior is actually the most, most common uh, position. LOA is the most common position. But sometimes when the fetus is in occipital posterior in labor, what happens? They, they will present commonly with PROM, premature rupture of membranes, or early onset of labor only they will have rupture of membranes. There will be frequent filling of the bladder. She will have this urge to pass urine repeatedly, and there will be premature bearing down. Normally, when does bearing down happen? When they are fully dilated. But here, they will have this urge to bear down, to push much, much earlier okay and abdominal examination you can clearly see here here see an occipital anterior is a well-rounded abdomen but here because the back is posterior so there is this dip okay infra umbilical flattening this is called this is classically seen in occipital posterior this is a very major clue which was given okay the head is usually unengaged uh, uh, in early labor only when contractions are good and the head flexes does the head go in Auscultation, you will hear the fetal heart towards the flank because it is across the back. So it will be heard best on the flanks. Okay. On any, when you do a vaginal examination, what will you find? So occipital posterior, usually the head is deflexed. When you have a deflexed head on vaginal examination, you will be able to feel the posterior, both the anterior and the posterior fontanelle uh, uh, better as against a well-flexed head where you will not be able to feel the anterior fontanelle, only the posterior fontanelle. So remember uh, the infra-umbilical flattening, remember premature bearing down and frequent filling of the bladder and easily palpable anterior fontanelle on a vaginal examination because the head is deflexed. Okay, next question. Following delivery, a woman has atonic PPH. Despite conservative measures, the bleeding persists. She's taken to the OT where the surgeon proceeds to do a devascularization procedure. Which vessels are ligated? Is it the uterine ovarian internal ILAC, uterine ovarian external ILAC, uterine vaginal pudendal, or uterine internal ILAC and the obturator? And the answer is the uterine, the ovarian, and the internal ILAC. So uh, we don't actually ligate the entire ovarian. We ligate the tubal branch of the ovarian artery where the tubo ovarian, ovario uterine anastomosis is happening. But this was the most appropriate answer. So the answer is uterine, a branch of the ovarian and the internal ILAC artery. So let's quickly see what do we do in PPH. When a woman has atonic postpartum hemorrhage, we do mechanical and medical methods simultaneously in the labor room. Okay, mechanical methods like uh, you, uh, uterine massage, bimanual uh, uterine compression, IOTO cable compression, and um, uh, medical methods, of course, oxytocin, mesoprostol, prostaglandin, F2-alpha, all these go hand, both of these go hand in hand along with 
measures like uh, uh, blood uh, uh, arranging, transfusing blood, uh, resuscitation of the patient. And then if that is not, uh, if that, that does not control the bleeding, then we resort to surgical methods. Uh, and what do we do in this? We do a stepwise devascularization, which we just discussed. Okay, so what here, look here. So this is the uterine artery, which we, the, which we ligate first. Then this is the tube, the utero ovarian anastomosis, where the tubal branch of the ovarian artery and the ascending branch of the uterine artery are ligated somewhere here. And if that does also is not controlled, then we ligate the anterior division of the hypogastric or the internal ILAC artery. So these are, this is what is a stepwise devascularization surgery. If this also does not control the bleeding, or you can also decide to do a compression suture that is a bilinch where you first compress the uterus and see if the bleeding is reduced. If yes, the bleeding is reduced on compressing the anterior posterior walls, then you can do a bilinch suture, okay? Which are basically two brace sutures like this. We compress the anterior and posterior wall. If that also fails to control the bleeding, then of course a hysterectomy as a last resort, obstetric hysterectomy. Okay, uh, instead of surgical methods, you can also opt for uterine artery embolization. If the patient is hemodynamically okay, uterine artery embolization can also be tried in place of surgical methods. So this is just briefly about PPH. It's a very in-detail topic and we will discuss this separately. But the answer here is uterine, ovarian and internal ileic artery ligation. Next question, a 21-year-old primary gravida presents with the anticlopidy. Her school-going nephew who lives in the same house has contracted varicella. What is varicella? Chickenpox. A blood sample is taken for antibodies against varicella. The report is negative. So what does this signify? So this signifies that she is she susceptible to chickenpox, to zoster, or is she immune to chickenpox and immune to zoster? The answer is she's susceptible to chicken pox. Okay, so she has negative antibodies basically means she's at a higher risk of developing chicken pox. And a little bit about chicken pox in pregnancy. So pregnant woman with so if a woman comes with uncertain or no previous history of chicken pox, like in this question, it's not mentioned with exposure to infection, as in this question, what should we do first, we should have a blood test to determine the varicella zoster virus immunity or non immunity to know whether she's susceptible to chicken pox not why because chicken pox in pregnancy is detrimental to the fetus and also to the mother more so to the fetus, especially if the contraction if the infection is contracted between 13 to 20 weeks where there's a risk of congenital varicella syndrome. Okay, so if, if the report is negative, like in this patient, the report was negative, what should you do then? You should give her varicella zoster immunoglobulin. All right. And it can be given up to 10 days after history of contact with a person who has or a child who has chickenpox. Okay. And if suppose she, despite the contact and despite her, you're giving VZIG or maybe she doesn't receive the immunoglobin, she develops chickenpox in pregnancy. What should you do? Within 24 hours of the onset of rash, start her on oral acyclovir. If it is severe chickenpox, you can start on intravenous acyclovir. There's no point giving immunoglobin once chickenpox has a rash has set in. And women who develop chickenpox in pregnancy at... Uh, in the mid trimester, refer them to a fetal medicine specialist. An ultrasound needs to be done to see if there are features of congenital varicella syndrome or five weeks after an infection has happened. And if an infection has happened in the last four weeks, so when she's about to deliver, try to avoid delivery for seven days because of the risk of neonatal varicella, which is again very, very high risk. Okay, so if the baby does develop CVS, congenital varicella syndrome, what is it characterized by? Choreoretinitis, microphthalmia, cerebral cortical atrophy, growth restriction, hydronephrosis, limb hypoplasia, and circuitial skin lesions. Okay, and as I said, the highest risk is between exposure between 13 to 20 weeks. Okay. Now, next question, a 28-year-old primary gravida presents at 36 weeks with painful vulval lesions. Okay, she does not give history of similar lesions in the past. So, this is an important statement. She does not give history of similar lesions in the past. On examination, there are multiple painful vesicular lesions. This is the other clue. Okay, so what is the best treatment option? So, when you see genital ulcers or vulval ulcers, which are multiple painful vesicular, the first thing you should think of is genital herpes or herpes simplex virus. Okay, this is the diagnosis. Now, since she does not give history of similar lesions, even in the past, this is primary HSV. And what happens in primary HSV at term, if the woman presents or near, nearing her delivery, there is a 50% chance of neonatal herpes simplex, which has a very, very high 
mortality. As again, secondary herpes, where the risk for fetus is only 1%. So if it's primary HSV, the risk is 50%. And that is why we have to avoid exposure of the neonate to vaginal secretions. And hence, an elective LSCS needs to be done in women with primary HSV. Remember this, very, very important. HSV has been asked in the past also. It's not something new. What you tend to forget because this is not something which is very routine. Okay, so what should you do? You should give acyclovir, that is antivirals, and plan an elective LSCS for her at term because this is primary HSV. There is a huge risk, 50% chance of neonatal herpes developing if she's allowed to deliver, if the baby get uh, if she's allowed to deliver vaginally and the baby is exposed to the vaginal secretions and the lesions. All right, I hope this is clear. So uh, this is the diagnosis is herpes simplex, painful vesicular lesions. That is why it is herpes simplex. Very high risk of neonatal infection up to 50%. And treatment is acyclovir and elective cesarean for active primary genital HSP infection. Okay, next question. This is also very, very simple. Commonly asked question. A 35-year-old woman is a chronic hypertensive. She visits, the, she visits you for preconceptional counseling. Which of the following antihypertensive needs to be stopped prior to conception? Should we stop calcium channel blockers, alpha methyl dopa, AC inhibitors, or labetalol? And we all know the answer is AC inhibitors because we know that AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are both contraindicated in pregnancy. Why are they contraindicated? Because they lead to renal hyper, hypoperfusion in the fetus and can lead to renal agenesis in the fetus, also severe oligohydramnus because of the renal agenesis. So if a woman is on AC inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, they need to be converted prior to conception to a safer antihypertensive. We can give calcium channel blockers, we can give alpha methyl dopa, and labetalol, we all know, is the drug of choice in pregnancy and hypertension. Okay, next question. Okay, a 28-year-old woman with a history of infertility for three years presents with six weeks amenorrhea. Okay, so we have a woman with infertility. She's come with six weeks amenorrhea. She comes with abdominal pain and spotting and her UPT is weakly positive. On examination, she is hemodynamically stable and there is a three into 2.5 centimeter left-sided adnexal lesion. Ultrasound reveals a left-sided sac with no cardiac activity, which is the best management option. So we obviously have a case of tubal ectopic which is unruptured, she's stable. The uh, ultrasound shows or the examination shows a three into 2.5 centimeter sac with no cardiac activities. And she has mild pain and spotting, but no other symptoms. So what will you do? The answer in this is we will not do expectant management and we will come to why we won't do it. We won't do a salpingectomy and we can do, but the preferred uh, 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 method would be an injectable methotrexate that is medical management we will follow and why we will follow medical management this is also pretty straightforward so when, when we have an unruptured ectopic we have so ruptured ectopic is obviously surgical management there are no doubts about that at all but unruptured ectopic we can have expectant management medical management or surgical management in expectant management it is basically for clinically stable asymptomatic women with an ultrasound diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. So clinically stable asymptomatic. So please remember, there should be no pain in this patient. Beta HCG should be less than 1000. I think I missed the beta HCG. In this, the value was given. It was actually 2800 in this patient. Okay, the beta HCG in this patient was 2800. It was mentioned in the exam. Okay, I think I missed that out. Okay, beta HCG should be less than 1000. Tubal, the size of the sac should be less than 35 mm no visible heartbeat, and she should be able to return to follow-up. So all the features should be there to consider expectant management. This patient we won't because there was mild pain and the beta HCG was more than 1000. So we will not consider expectant management in this patient. We will consider medical management. Why? Because so medical management basically means injection, methotrexate, usually a single dose regime is what is followed. And what is it is given as 50 milligram per meter square okay a single dose and then we follow up with beta hcg levels what do we do in expected management we simply follow up with beta hcg levels or depending on the patient's symptoms so what what do we do in medical management what are the criteria to follow medical management if the patient is stable she has no significant symptoms sac is less than 3.5 centimeters so let's stick what all the patient was stable 
no significant symptoms, SACOS less than 3.5, no cardiac activity, serum BKC less than 5,000 and no contraindication to methotrexate. We will do medical management would be the med, uh, choice in this patient. Now, if what will you do for surgical management? So surgical management basically means a laparoscopy, okay? And usually it is a salpingostomy or a salpingectomy. And when will you do a surgical management? If she has significant pain, or she has an adnexal mass of 35 mm or larger, or there is cardiac activity, or there is a beta HCG of 5,000 or more. So if any of these are present, and I'm saying any, not in these two, we have to have all the conditions present to follow these managements. In surgical, if any of these are present, a surgical management is indicated. So I hope this is clear, roughly, uh, briefly, sorry, about ectopic pregnancy. So uh, just a brief flowchart again, his, based on history examination investigations, it could be a rupture or an un unruptured ectopic. If it is an unruptured ectopic, we have expectant medical and surgical management. Ex expectant just basically means follow up with beta HCG. Medical in means giving methotrexate, a single dose, 50 milligram per meter square. And surgical management refers to doing a laparoscopy if it is unruptured or and a laparotomy if she is, or a laparotomy if she is hemodynamically unstable in a, as in a ruptured ectopic. So surgical management, you can either do a laparoscopy or a laparotomy. And what do you do? You do a salpingectomy or salpingostomy, which is conservative, conserve the tube, just uh, remove the products if it is an unruptured and a salpingectomy if uh, it is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So this is briefly about the management of ectopic pregnancy. Okay, next question. This is also very, very straightforward. A 28-year-old woman has been on oral contraceptive pills for five months. She comes with six weeks amenorrhea UPT is positive. So she's pregnant on OC pills she conceived. What is the most accurate method to determine the gestational age in this woman? Is it from the LMP? Is it counting from the UPT positive? It is, the answer is on an ultrasound. So whenever a woman has conceived and she's not had regular cycles before, we obviously can't rely on her LMP. We obviously can't rely when her UPT was positive. We don't know when ovulation happened, when did she conceive. And the most accurate measurement of gestation age in general, otherwise also is by in first trimester, is by measuring the crown rump length on the ultrasound. Obviously, examination of uterine size is again very inaccurate. Most accurate is this. If it's the second trimester, the question is asked, and the bipyrital diameter is the best way to measure the gestational age. In the first trimester, it is the crown rump length. Okay, next question. So the, that I think deals with the obstetric questions. Now we'll move on to the gynae questions. The first question is a 16-year-old girl with a partial transverse vaginal septum presents with dysmenorrhea and chronic pelvic pain. Which of the, the following is she likely to have? So she has a partial transverse vaginal septum. What, this is the uterus. This is the vagina. What is a transverse vaginal septum? It is a septum basically obstructing, a transverse septum obstructing the vagina and this is partial so there may be a small opening somewhere okay so is it a thecal uterine cyst is it that the cause of her symptoms is it endometriosis is it a tube ovarian abscess or is it dermoid cyst and the answer here is endometriosis because any obstruction any obstructive so this is a mullerian anomaly any obstructive mullerian anomaly what does it lead to like a imperfect hymen or a tvs transversal septum it leads to backflow of blood so menstrual blood accumulates Okay, although it may be partial, some blood may be coming, but some blood may be accumulating, causing hematocolpus, that is blood in the vagina, causing a hematometra, blood in the uterine cavity, and this retrograde menstrual blood goes into the fallopian tubes, into the ovaries, and leads to endometriosis, into the peritoneal cavity, and leads to endometriosis, and that is common with obstructive Mullerian anomalies. So this is a transvaginal septum. It could be high, mid or low. It could be partial. That is a small opening could be there. It could be complete. They commonly present with primary amenorrhea with cyclical abdominal pain. They may be menstruating if there is an opening. But if you leave them untreated, the accumulated blood causes hematometra, hematocolpus first, then hematometra, and then finally endometriosis. And that is why she's having these symptoms. Okay. Thecarotin cysts, where are they seen? They are commonly seen in complete molar pregnancy okay tubo ovarian abscess is basically seen in pelvic inflammatory disease and dermoid cyst of course you know what that is but it has no association with a transverse vaginal septum 
Okay, next question. So now we have all the questions on malaria normally starting. So 29 year old woman is undergoing evaluation for infertility. The following test is done. What is this test? So this is a similar picture. It was actually a picture of an HS. This is the answer is an HS. This is very obvious. This is a hysterosalpingogram. And there was a unicorn at uterus seen in the image, like in this image. Okay, so this is what uh, the image was. This was very, very, this was the only image that was asked. It was very, very straightforward. It is, an, it is a hysterosalpingogram. It is not a genitogram. Genitogram is basically used to see external genitalia, anomalies in the external genitalia and the bladder. Okay, this is not a CT scan, obviously. This is not a sonosalpingogram. Sonosalpingogram is basically an ultrasound. And this is, this is these are different images of an HSG, how they appear. And this is a sonosalpingogram. So this is an ultrasound. Sono means ultrasound and salpingogram. Basically, we're seeing the, we inject saline in the uterine cavity and we look for fluid. The saline will, will um, distend the uterine cavity. And if the tubes, tubes are patent, the, there will be fluid seen in the pouch of Douglas on ultrasound. So that is how a sono salpingogram will look. This is the distended uterine cavity in a sono salpingogram. This is a fibroid, which a sono salpingogram has delineated. The fluid has made this fibroid stand out. So this is how a SSG will look like. And this is what we have seen in the question is a HSG, a hysterosalpingogram. Okay. Next question, a 28 year old with recurrent, with, two, with history of uh, three abortions with recurrent second trimester abortions was found to have a uterine scepter on sonosalpingography. What is the best management option? So we've given that there's a way of told there's a uterine septum. Okay, what is a uterine septum? It is something like this. It is a septa dividing the endometrial cavity. Will you do a DNC, a laparoscopic metroplasty, a laparotomy and metroplasty or a hist hist hystroscopic septoplasty? The answer is we will do a hystroscopic septal resection. This has been asked in different forms in the past. The answer is a hystroscopic septal resection. So what is a septate uterus? It is a septa, a longitudinal vertical septa in the uterine cavity associated with infertility, abortions, preterm labor, malpresentations and retained placenta. How will you diagnose this? You can, uh, these are all non-invasive methods, HSG, 3D scan, MRI, but invasive and confirmatory is obviously a hysteroscopy. It is also therapeutic also where we do can do an operative hysteroscopy and cut the septum. So this is how an HSG of a, um, a septate uterus will look like. This is this picture, this one is a, a, this is a 3D ultrasound of a septate uterus. And this is how the hysteroscopic picture will look like. This in the middle is a thick septa separating the two uterine cavities. So what will you do? We'll do a, this is a resection. Okay, this is called a resectoscope, the instrument used. And this is resection using electrocoagulation of the septum. This is a septum and using electrocoagulation, we keep going straight up and cutting this septum. The septum, uterine septums are avascular structures and usually will not, you will not end up with bleeding but perforation can be a complication uterine perforation can be a complication of doing this we can also cut the septum using a scissors a plain scissors without any current or we can also use bipolar to cut this septum okay the next question this is also mullerian so you can see so many questions of mullerian anomalies it's a very important topic uh, but it's very easy also you won't get asked many complicated questions usually easy questions are asked and you can answer them very straightforwardly a 28 year old woman being evaluated for infertility was found to have a uterine didelphis on 3d scan all are possible complications except so whenever you have mullerian anomalies which are not obstructive okay then we usually have obstetric complications like preterm labor like recurrent abortions like malpresentations but we do not see endometriosis. So the answer is endometriosis is seen only, as I said, in a trans or channel septum or an imperfect hymen or even a non-communicating uh, horn uh, uh, of a unicornial uterus. You can have sometimes a rudimentary horn, which is non-communicating, which has functional endometrium. That can lead to endometriosis. Okay, but these uh, didelphis, a bicornet uterus, a septate uterus, these will not lead to endometriosis. So this is just, uh, just to show you the American Fertility Society classification. Uh, and now we have the SJ classification. I have not covered that. We will cover that in a separate class on Mullerian anomalies. But you should understand that in a diadelphous uterus or a bicornet uterus or a septate uterus, so these three, okay, or even an arcuate uterus, you will not see these complications. You will not see obstructive complications. You will see complications like spontaneous abortions, recurrent pregnancy loss, cervical incompetence, preterm labor, malpresentation. 
uh, difficulty obstructed uh, uh, um, prolonged labor because of uterine dystocia obstructed labor or even a retained placenta so obstetric complications are more common okay even infertility but uh, when you have an obstruction okay like a septum okay like here uh, hypoplasia vaginal agenesis or a septum uh, here, like here that is when you find obstruction and hematom colpus hematometra and uh, endometriosis all right Next question, a 28-year-old woman is undergoing evaluation for recurrent pregnancy losses on ultrasound uh, mullerian anomaly is suspected. What is the best way to confirm this? Is it a TVS? Is it a HSG? Is it a CCT? Or is it a hysteroscopy laparoscopy? Please remember the best way to confirm. So the question, read the question, what is the best way to confirm is a hysteroscopy and laparoscopy because the best way to confirm a learning anomaly is actually seeing the anomaly. And how do you actually see the anomaly is by visual, direct visualization. How is that best achieved? By doing a hysteroscopy and a laparoscopy. So a TVS, uh, these are all non-invasive, okay? And the best way among these are a 3D ultrasound and a MRI. These Two are the investigations of choice, non-invasive investigations of choice for Mullerian anomalies are 3D scan and MRI. A hysteroscopy and laparoscopy is an invasive way, but it is the best way to confirm. They're not asked non-invasive or invasive, they're asked the best way. The best way is direct visualization, and that is by doing a hysteroscopy and a laparoscopy. Next question, a, a woman with previous three abortions presents with a history of three abortions, the first at eight weeks, Okay, the first had eight weeks, then 11 weeks, and then 24 weeks. And at the 24 weeks one, there was a history of uh, early onset preeclampsia, which is the most likely cause of her abortion. So please remember, the answer here is, I think we all know this is Aplan. Why? Because they've given the classical history of early onset of preeclampsia, which is characteristically seen in Apla. So Apla presents with recurrent uh, it could be first trimester losses, it could be second trimester losses, um, it could be, here also the other clue was given that cardiac activity was seen in all the three pregnancies. Okay, please remember, torch never presents with RPL. Torch can present with spontaneous abortions, but it doesn't present with recurrent pregnancy loss. Syphilis can present with recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, uh, but syphilis, the clue here was the early onset preeclampsia. And GDM, we all know, can present. The GDM usually presents with uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. It can also present as IUDs at term, intrauterine deaths. Okay, but this is not a classical presentation of early onset preeclampsia. So what are the causes of RPL? We have endocrine, immunological, anatomical, chromosomal, inherited thrombophilias, and infections. And infections more, I would say, bacterial vaginosis and syphilis. Torch does not cause RPL. Please remember this. Many of the students get confused. Torch does not cause recurrent pregnancy loss. What is APLA? APLA basically is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. It is an acquired thrombophilia and it is uh, the, the, the criteria to diagnose APLA is by what is called a Sapporo criteria where the presence of one clinical and one lab criteria is a must. What are the clinical criteria? Either vascular thrombosis or a pregnancy morbidity. One should be there. And in pregnancy morbidity, what do we include? One or more deaths of a normal fetus at more than equal to 10 weeks or one or more premature birth at less than 34 weeks, like in this case, due to severe preeclampsia or more than three consecutive abortions at less than 10 weeks. Okay. And what are the lab criteria to diagnose um, uh, APLA? We have, should have either anti-cardiolipin antibody, lupus anticoagulant, or anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1. So any one of this plus any one of this is equal to diagnosing APLA. Okay, remember this, Sapporo criteria is very important. Usually a question on APLA does come and usually it's a simple question. Okay, next question. So we have, this was a case of choriocarcinoma. If you remember this question, 25-year-old woman had evacuation of molar pregnancy done six months earlier. She now presents with general ill health, breathlessness, irregular bleeding. On chest x-ray, there were classical cannonball metastasis. Her beta CG levels were persistently high. What is the best management option? Do we give multi-dose methotrexate, folinic acid? Do we give single-dose methotrexate? Do we do a hysterectomy? Or do we give Imaco? What is the answer? The answer is multi-dose methotrexate and folinic acid. Why? Because this is choriocarcinoma. This is stage three choriocarcinoma because it's gone to the lungs. Okay, but please remember, even though it is metastasized to the lungs, these are very uh, uh, responsive to methotrexate. And how is it given? It's given as a multi-dose regime. Day one, three, five, seven, we give methotrexate. Day two, four, six, eight, we give folinic acid for the rescue. Okay, hysterectomy is not done only in severe cases, not responsive to treatment. So let's just discuss this briefly. 
I have some slides on here. So how do you diagnose GTN? Either the beta disease is plateauing or increasing, or we have a histological diagnosis, or beyond six months also, persistence of HCG is there like in this woman. So following a molar pregnancy evacuation, we do weekly beta HCG till it touches normal, then monthly till six months. So in this woman, despite six months, HCG was persisting. You should expect it to touch zero around eight weeks following the evacuation of a molar pregnancy. Okay, so how do we stage GTT, gestational trophoblastic tumors? Uh, uh, stage one is confined to the uterus. Stage two is confined to the genital organs. Stage three is metastasized to the lungs. And stage four is metastasized to other organs like the brain or the liver. Okay, and you, this also, you should know, this is the WHO prognostic scoring. So uh, this woman, she had less, at least the, the factors we had, we could gauge that she was low risk. How do we know that? Her age was less than 40, at least what was given to us. There was a... A molar pregnancy which led to this not a uh, uh, another pregnancy it was a four to six months duration we don't have this value we don't have this value but we have this the metastasis, metastasis was to the lung okay and she had not received prior chemotherapy so this was all in all less than six is uh, the score is less than six this is uh, 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 this is a good response uh, uh, it will have a good response to chemotherapy and what do we give for stage one we can give single agent chemotherapy okay stage two and three also single agent chemotherapy okay but if they're high risk in either or if it's stage four then combination chemotherapy is advised this is a low risk from the factors we have and uh, uh, this is metastasized only to the lung and uh, which is again low uh, comes under a good prognostic score so in her we will give single agent chemotherapy but that single agent is given as multi-dose Con don't get confused single agent that is only methotrexate but multi-dose day one three five seven with rescue dose of folinic acid on day two four six eight so please read choreocarcinoma very very important topic Okay, next question. So we had some questions on oral contraceptive pills. Uh, Reema Devi, a 28-year-old newly married woman, comes to the sub-center. She started on oral contraceptive pills and she comes two weeks after starting the pill with a history of missing four tablets on different days. So what will you advise her? Will you advise her to discontinue the packet and start an alternate method? Will you ask her to take the four missing tablets the next day and give her emergency contraception, ask her to use a condom? Uh, or will you ask her to take the next pill as soon as possible, continue the remaining packet, condom, plus emergency contraception? Or will you ask her to take the next pill and continue the same packet? So what will you do? Little law lengthy question, little confusing, but I have tried to make it very simple. Missed pill is a very important question which is asked. So if there's a history of one missed pill, what will you do? This is very straightforward. You will ask her to take the next pill the missed pill as soon as possible suppose she missed her pill yesterday and she comes to you I tell her to take it right now and continue taking the remaining packets and no additional the remaining pills and no additional contraception is required so one pill is easy just take the missed pill and continue but if she's had a history of two or more missed pills that is she's more than 48 hours late uh, and she has missed two or more pills what will you do? Like in this patient, she. what should you do? The last missed pill should be taken as soon as possible. So the next pill should be taken as soon as possible. Leave the earlier missed pill. So you don't have to take four missed pills immediately. Just take the next pill as soon as possible. Use additional contraception for seven days. Further to reduce the risk of pregnancy, what should you do? So depending on when she has missed those pills, if she's missing the first seven days of the cycle, give her emergency contraception. In the second week, no need for additional contraception. In the third week, what should you do? You should omit the pill-free period. 21 days ka packet was omit the pill-free period. The one week where you give a break, omit that and start a new packet immediately after on the 22nd day. If that is if the pill is missing the third week. So in this patient, what happened? We'll just go back. In this patient, she missed it in the first two weeks of the cycle. So what should we do? We should give emergency contraception. So she should take the next pill as soon as possible, continue the remaining packet, give additional contraception for seven days. And since the pill was missed in the first week, most likely the first week, we don't know. First two weeks, she's come to us. So we will give her emergency contraception. If she'd come to us in the third week, okay, or with a history of missing the third week, then we will omit the pill free period and start a new packet immediately after. Okay, so this is very straightforward. Um, uh, little confusing, but remember two or more missed pills, what should you do? Okay, I hope this is clear. Next question, sorry. 
A 30-year-old woman, again on OC pills, was diagnosed to have pulmonary tuberculosis. She started on first-line ATT as per guidelines. She is also taking oral contraceptive pills. Her doctor advises her to use another contraceptive method. What is the reason for this advice? Is it because OC pills will cause failure of her ATT? Is it because rifampicin or endomethacin are teratogenic? Or is it because rifampicin induces metabolism of OC pills? This is actually a pharmacology question, but relevant to OPS and gynae, so we put it here. Rifampicin induces metabolism of oral contraceptive pills. Okay, so OC pills and drug interactions, a little bit about this. Enzyme-inducing drugs like rifampicin significantly reduce, significantly reduce OC pill effects. So always advise another method or an additional method of contraception if a woman is on ATT with rifampicin. Other medications to a lesser extent, these also reduce OCP efficacy. What are they? Antibiotics, mainly amoxicillin, ampicillin, erythromycin, antifungals, fluconazole, grisofalvin, itraconazole, ketoconazole, also metronidazole and also um, uh, antiretroviral therapy, ritonavir. So remember these, these reduce OCP efficacy, but to a lesser extent significantly reduces rifampicin. Also very important, anti-epileptic drugs, you can always get a question from here also, these are associated with reduced OCP efficacy because these are enzyme-inducer drugs. Which ones? Carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, ethosuximide, phenophenobarbital, phenytoin, primidone, and topiramate. Okay, another very important thing you should remember in this is if a woman is taking lamotrigine and she's on OCP pills, you need to increase the dose of lamotrigine or switch to another anti-epileptic because OCPIL will increase the clearance of lamotrigine and reduce the level of lamotrigine in the blood. So she will be increasing her risk of seizures if you're giving OC pills with lamotrigine. So remember these drugs, they are oral contraceptive pills and drug interactions. Very, very important high yield topic. Next, very easy question, 55-year-old lady with five children presents with leakage of urine on coughing. On examination, there is second degree prolapse with cystocele. What is the most likely urinary abnormality? Is it overflow incontinence? Is it urge incontinence? Stress or neurogenic bladder? And we all know the answer is stress. Quickly, what is stress incontinence? If there's increased intra-brown pressure, coughing, laughing, straining, there is leakage, involuntary leakage of urine is stress. Urge is when there is overactive bladder, and there is involuntary contraction of the deutrosal muscle. What is the classical history? Patient will have involuntary leakage and she, which will be immediately preceded by sudden urge to voice. She'll have a sudden urge to voice. She won't be able to reach the toilet. She will leak urine before reaching the toilet. That is called as urge incontinence. What is overflow? Overflow is usually seen typically if there's an obstruction, urethral obstruction, and then uh, she's unable to pass urine. Uh, there's overflow leakage because of the obstructive pathology. And what is neurogenic? There's usually a, a CNS or a peripheral nervous system defect and due to impaired functioning of the nervous system, there is a neurogenic bladder. So these are the types of incontinence. This was classical stress incontinence, which was asked in the question. Okay, so next question. A 28-year-old woman, the infertility presents to you. On ultrasound, there is an intramural fibroid, 7 into 5 centimeter in the right corner, and another one, 5 into 5 in the left corner. And when you do an HST, you find that is because there are fibroids, probably there is tubal block at the region of the tubal ostia. Semen and parameters are normal. Patient is ovulating. What is the best management? So the best management is, should we give GNR channel off? Should we do a myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy? Should, should we do ART, that is artificial reproductive technique, that is IVF? Or should we do a uterine artery embolization? So GNR is not given because it won't help. She has infertility. You're not giving it for any other symptom. It will reduce the size, but that won't help reduce, relieve the obstruction at the tubes. Uterine artery embolization is contraindicated if a woman wants to conceive. Okay, so these two are out. We will do a, the answer here is a laparoscopic myomectomy. Why? Because indications of myomectomy in infertility are, if so if there's any submucosal fibroids, what is a submucosal fibroid? This is the uterus. This is the cavity. These are submucosal fibroids. It could be type 0, type 1, or type 2. Any submucosal fibroid has to be removed if the woman is infertile. Please remember this. Whether you're planning ART or not, remove the submucosal fibroid. Intram any intramural fibroid more than 5 cm. So more than 5 cm intramural fibroid. If a patient has infertility, if you're planning 
IVF or otherwise also needs to be removed, especially if they are cornwall. Okay, so remember they are blocking the tubes. These fibroids are blocking the tube, so we have to remove them and then reassess the patient if the tubal patency is there after myomectomy. Then she can be allowed to conceive naturally. And even if we're planning IVF, we can't do IVF with such big fibroids because they will impair the IVF outcome. They will also impair the pregnancy outcome. So anything more than five centimeter before infertility treatment needs to be removed. Submucous fibroids, that is fibroids lying here, need not be removed. If the woman has infertility, they are unlikely to cause any problem in the unless they're very, very huge like this. And you may find that they'll find cause some problem in pregnancy or they are causing symptoms. Otherwise, we will not remove them. Okay, so remember submucous fibroids need to be removed. Intramural fibroids, if they are distorting the cavity or if they are more than five centimeters need to be removed. Subserous fibroids need not be removed if the woman is infertile. Next question, a 25-year-old woman who is anxious to conceive comes to the OPD with complaints of profuse white discharge for two days, no itching, and her menstrual cycles are regular. Also given here, which I've missed, is her LMP was 13 days back. The most likely diagnosis is, so is it trichomoniasis, is it physiological, is it BV, or is it candidiasis? So what are the clues here? We have only history of short duration, two days, approximately mid-cycle because her LMP was 13 days back, okay, and it is almost, it is non-pruritic, okay, so the answer here, is this should be a physiological discharge, okay, the other thing you can think of is BV because she has history of infertility, okay, but BV will have more symptoms, okay, the, the trichomoniasis and candidiasis will be pruritic, Okay, so I've just given a brief table of how the characteristics of the different infections. Trichomoniasis is greenish yellow, candidiasis is curdy white. BV is gray white to green yellow white. Here it was given white discharge. Okay, normal discharge is white. Chlamydia is mucopurulent. Okay, so uh, pruritus will be pruritus will be present in trichomoniasis and candidiasis. Okay, but uh, here it was non irritant. Okay, and ovulation around ovulation discharge increases. So this was characteristically physiological white discharge. Next question, a 39-year-old woman presents to the medicine OPD with complaints of fatigue and lethargy. She gives a history of delivering a 3.5 kg baby five years earlier, following which she received multiple, so uh, blood transfusions. this is the first clue, multiple blood transfusions following delivery. So she probably had postpartum hemorrhage and she never resumed menstruation. So she has amenorrhea right now, second clue, and also had failure of lactation, third clue. So what is this? This is very easy. This is a clinical scenario and so many clues given. This is Sheehan syndrome. What is Sheehan syndrome? It is pituitary necrosis following, usually following postpartum hemorrhage. And that is the clue given. So postpartum hemorrhage leads to hypotension and peripartum, uh, sorry, postpartum pituitary necrosis. And this leads to amenorrhea, lactation failure, secondary adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism. What do you treat this with? By giving supplemental hormones. So this, these are the features you will find in Sheehan's syndrome. Okay, and this was quite a straightforward question. I'm sure all of you got this right. Next question, a 12-year-old girl is brought to the OPD by her mother. She is concerned that she is shorter, that the daughter is shorter than her peers. So she has short height on examination. Again, a lot of clues in this question. She has shield-like chest. She has ptosis, drooping eyelids, and a webbed neck. Web neck is, again, a classical presentation. What are we dealing here? I think this is very self-explanatory. Turner syndrome. Okay, on evaluation, which of the following would you expect to find? And the answer here is an ultrasound showing streak ovaries and a small uterus, okay? What would the finding on echo be in a turners? They should be coactation of iota. Hepatomegaly is not seen. Renal abnormalities are not seen with Turner syndrome. So what is Turner syndrome? Which is 45 XO, okay? And these are the features, short stage, uh, uh, typical facial anomalies, low hairline will be there, full web neck will be there, shield uh, like chest with widely spaced nipples then shortened uh, metacarpal, small fingernails, streak ovaries. So classically, they will present with primary amenorrhea, okay, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, streak or underdevelopment rudimentary ovaries. Okay, so this is how Turner syndrome, and they're obviously short in height. So this is how Turner syndrome will present. Again, very commonly asked question, and I'm sure all of you got this right. Okay, so that... Um,
uh, ends this discussion and I hope this was useful. It was a pretty straightforward, easy paper. And uh, uh, I wish all of you uh, good luck for the upcoming November INICT. And please uh, do subscribe and uh, follow uh, the channel, subscribe to the channel and uh, uh, do like the videos. Uh, thank you very much.